best ever listeners. Welcome to the best real estate investing advice ever show. I'm Ash Patel, and I'm with today's guest, John McEwen. John is joining us from Chicago, Illinois. He is the president of High Fidelity Property Management, a third-party property management company that has 1,000 units under management. His portfolio consists of being a GP and LP investor. John, thank you for joining us, and how are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. It's our pleasure. John, before we get started, can you give the best ever listeners a little bit more about your background and what you're focused on now? Sure. Um, I always tell people I have an old soul in real estate. Um, I grew up in Chicago. I went to Lane Tech and uh, right after high school, I joined the Navy. I was in the Navy for four years from 99 to 2003. Um, right after I got out of the Navy, I, I got into real estate at the age of 24. And um, it just feels like I've had a lot more times at bat and swings at the ball than a lot of my, uh, a lot of people my age in the industry. And um, I, I, I really enjoy real estate. I like the complexities it brings. Um, there, there are challenges pretty much every day that you have to solve. And, uh, you know, little, little trial and error um, is good, I think. And if, uh, you know, you're not getting new business or growing, then the, the business goes. So we're very focused on, on growth. Um, but, but more quality over quantity, I would say for sure. I want to ask how you got into real estate at the age of 24, but I really want to know how did you get into property management? Cause that's the painful stuff that everybody wants to outsource. So let's start with 24 years old out of the Navy and thank you for your service. Thank you for your, to your family for all their sacrifices as well. But what was it that got you in real estate? Uh, so I, I had a friend whose father was a business consultant for the company Chicago Apartment Finders. And at the time I didn't have a car and I was um, transitioning from military life to civilian life. And I was looking, I, I kind of, you know, wanted a job right away. I, I felt like idle hands make, make the devils work. So I wanted to keep myself busy. And my friend told me, he said, my dad's got the, he's at this company, Chicago Apartment Finders. It's the best kept secret in Chicago right now. This is in 2004. Um, yeah, but I don't have a car. So I started on the listing side, calling landlords to list non-exclusively for Chicago Apartment Finders. And through that, I worked there for about like four and a half years. And um, I just kind of like unpeeled the onion. You know, I like got to know the psychology of a landlord. I got to know the psychology of property management companies, uh, the people who work there. And um, I was infatuated with how fast and frenetic the business was. The psychology of landlords Help me understand that. And by the way, my wife used Chicago Apartment Finders uh, around the 2004 time when she found an apartment on Lakeshore Drive. That was a phenomenal deal, but... Uh, right. psychology of landlords. What did you learn? Just the, you know, like the, the more, more like the pain points and the, and the, uh, the, the line of thinking, um, you know, to elaborate what I mean is vacancy is a killer. Um, everybody wants to grow the top line, crunch the middle line and increase the bottom line to speak it, you know, to, to put it in simplest terms. Um, but I think weirdly, a lot of people in our industry miss that, you know, that, that like it's about growing the top line, crunching the middle line and fattening the bottom line for people. Um, I found at Apartment Finders, I could do that um, through analysis, um, like forthright consultation and then execution, like making sure that we had a plan, if that makes sense. It does. And how do you pitch that to uh, landlords, investors? The way we would, I would pitch it is, uh, you know, we're, we're a big enough company that there are a lot of policies and procedures in place so that things don't slip through the cracks, but we're um, small enough and boutique still where um, you're going to get that personalized service from me, your account manager. Um, I'm going to be with you through every step of the way, um, assuring them that communication is going to be um, paramount and, and that I value um, weekly, consistent communication, whether it's good news or bad news, just letting people know what's going on. Um, that, that to me uh, is, is what wins me the most business. I mean, that and then, and then 
the results, you know, showing people what I had done in the past and sort of establishing a track record and having projects or people that they could refer to or talk to that um, had success with me. Um, that, that was very helpful. And John, your, are your fees in line with your competition or higher, lower? I don't, you know, really concern myself with what the competition does as far as their fees. I charge one month's rent. Um, that is, that's what I have to charge to make my margin, to, to make the business meaningful for me. I pay for all the marketing. We pay for the photos. I pay the agents. I, I pay uh, processors and uh, coordinators and accountants to make sure everything is sort of happening as it needs to in sequence. And um, with that, like my, my fee is one month rent. And that's on the landlord side, right? The person right. looking for the apartment doesn't pay anything. Correct. Okay. And then do you also manage the property beyond that? We do. That's, that's sort of um, the name of the game for me is to uh, acquire properties either through ownership or through management where, where we lease. I, I want full operational control really. So like we do third party leasing for, for a number of people. Um, but, but really our focus is to bring property management business. I lost you. It just froze. Oh, really? That's weird. Uh, yeah. where, where'd you lose me? Uh, you said really our property is, uh, our primary objective is uh, leasing. Well, property management, managing properties, whether that's through um, me buying them or syndicating them or taking on third party business. Um, we, we like to be in control of the process is what I was saying. Okay, so are you in the business of uh, managing other people's properties, or is that not your preference? Totally, totally, we do that. About uh, okay, I'd say eighty-five percent of the portfolio is third party. Got it. But you want to control not just the leasing, but the entire life cycle management of that tenant. Oh uh, yes, that's correct. So from from the the minute we get a new tenant, we lease the apartment to their move in, the, the turnover, getting it clean, getting it painted, the tenant experience, um, maintenance requests, uh, you know, making sure they're paying their rent, paying rent on time, um, following the terms of the lease. Uh, and then when, you know, renewals come again, um, making sure that we're keeping our eye on the market and we know exactly um, how much to charge for a renewal rate and how much to charge for a market rate. All right, this makes me want to buy an apartment in Chicago so I can have you guys do it all for me. Let's do it. Do you, do you also draft the leases? We do. That's part of the, that's included in the, the one month fee is the administrative side. So uh, Chicago has a lot of um, laws, rules uh, there that, that um, for those of you who are not from Chicago, it's, it, it's kind of a, um, it's like an addendum to the Chicago lease. Uh, it's called the CRLTO, the Chicago Residential Landlord Tenant Ordinance. And it's very important that landlords follow the, the terms of the ordinance. And it takes someone like me, who, who has an intimate understanding of the ordinance and how it's applied to make sure that, you know, people aren't falling into pits. Yeah, Illinois and Chicago specifically are very tenant friendly places. Did you have a hard time during COVID? Actually, we fared pretty well. I mean, I think everybody had a hard time during COVID. So to say that I didn't have a hard time at all, I think would, would not be accurate. But um, it was hard at first, like the first couple months. Uh, but we implemented a, uh, a rental deferment plan. The big, the big thing people were concerned about is uh, people's ability to pay rent, right? And so we, we decided to come up with a blanket deferment plan um, that we implemented portfolio wide. And I think that bought us a lot of grace with um, the tenants or, or residents in the, in the portfolio. Um, Cause the message was like, look, if there are people who can't pay um, we need you to authenticate that you can't pay. And once that's done, we'll work something out with you. For those of you who can pay, please keep paying so that those who can't, we can, we can help them. And that message was really well received. So um, 
you know, I think I think like a lot of other operators in Chicago, we we had uh, some vacancy issues for a minute there. We we had some rental rental rate decline. Um, things kind of sharply and steeply fell off uh, as far as uh, those two things. But then, um, sort of like adapting and overcoming, and um, like just keeping your finger on the market and what's happening in real time is what saved our bacon. And John, what's the biggest mistake people make when they self-manage properties? Uh, wow. I, I will say this, that a lot of people who self-manage who come to me kind of come to me with like a, um, like a tangled mess, you know, like no one, no one comes to me and says, Hey, John, I have this building. It's amazing. It's running perfectly. All you have to do is just kind of keep the gears spinning. Like, I think the mistake is people try to do too much, too fast, too soon, and, um, maybe overestimate the time or actually underestimate how much time it takes to properly manage a building. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of work. And I think that's what happens is people get into real estate, you know, I'm gonna buy this investment property and I'm gonna manage it myself. It's the American dream. It's a great way to make some extra income and build wealth. Um, but then job number two gets in the way. Or if you're an investment group and you're managing on your own and you don't have the proper infrastructure or you're not using the right software, uh, to succinctly answer your question though, um, I would say, having a good cast of vendors is one of the hardest things for um, property owners who are managing themselves. And a lot of people come to me because they know I have in-house maintenance and they are hoping or relying on the fact that we're gonna be able to get to things faster than they would and it would take us a lot less time. So that, that's what I, I see from my purview as the biggest mistake is like underesting, underestimating how much time and then not having the right resources. And a twist on that question, what is the biggest mistake you see other professional property management companies make? You know, it's a mistake I make too sometimes. And it's uh, just you, you, when you're, your business, you're, you're, like I said at the beginning, you're kind of like always in go mode and you're always wanting to grow and you're always looking at the next best thing. And you have to remember that your existing portfolio is the gold and that new people are silver. Uh, new clients or new buildings are silver. Your existing portfolio is gold. And I think that a lot of people kind of flip that and they devalue their existing client base and they overvalue new business. Um, that's, that's my answer. Yeah. And how vertically integrated are you? We're, uh, you know, we're almost there fully, fully vertically integrated. Like we, we have, um, you know, a team of accountants. We have a team of the leasing team also sells. So uh, we can, we can sell, we can help people buy, we, we help people lease. Um, we have in-house maintenance, in-house janitorial and snow removal, uh, in-house legal counsel. Um, we don't do construction. Um, but otherwise, we're, we're pretty much there. Why not sell turnkey properties to investors? We do. Ah, you do. Tell me about that. Uh, you know, like, like um, there in Chicago, there are a lot of very talented, very capable multifamily brokers. Um, a lot of them I have, I have an immense amount of respect for, and we, we trade business with each other. So I keep... Um, most, most of the business we do is like 2 million and below. So whether that's a two flat, a three flat, a condo, a single family home, um, sometimes at that price point, you can get uh, up to six to eight units depending on the neighborhood. So we, we focus a lot on like the one-offs where people have uh, a smaller building and they're, they're looking to sell it and they want us to be the broker to do it. Um, and that's, that's sort of with our left hand. We're not out there really, you know, megaphoning to the world that we're, we're multifamily. It's sort of, we kind of try and keep it all within the, the uh, portfolio. So like we, we, you know, one owner will come to us and say, hey, I want to sell this building. What are your thoughts on, on how to get it prepped for sale? What are your thoughts on price? We go down that rabbit hole and, and once, once we're aligned, I, I part of my pitch to the owner who I, at this point have like a, a good relationship with, I, I tell them, you know, we, we can um, market this to our, our, uh, our investors 
And we'll see if we get any bites that way. And if that doesn't work, I have uh, a large network of brokers that I know. Um, maybe they have somebody who's interested. And that, that sort of entices people enough um, to give us a shot or at least the first crack. What I meant by selling turnkey properties in is basically uh, you take a very busy professional business owner, whatever, and they want some real estate exposure, but they don't want a syndication. They actually want to own whatever it is they're buying. Do you set something up where they buy a property and really that's the last time they're ever involved in it because you manage everything? We, we deal with people from, you know, high net worth individuals from both coasts, uh, really all over the country. A lot of people, you know, even international in some instances. And uh, yeah, that's the, the appeal. A lot of times is uh, someone wants to come in, they'll sacrifice cap rate um, for a building that's sealed up really nicely and is turnkey. Um, and then they hire us to manage it. So whether we're selling them that or a broker, another one of my friends is selling them that and then they refer it in, um, it happens all the time. Okay. Do you also do short-term rentals? Not us. No. Why not? Everybody, it's hot right now, John. It Everybody's is. You know, doing it. I'm a Navy guy and I'm very cautious and I, uh, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I had a hard time kind of uh, finding my identity in the real estate space as it is. Um, it took me a very long time to figure out who I am what I offer, why I'm different, why people want to work with me. And um, I just don't really want to deviate from my plan. Like I got a plan in place and, I, and there's always going to be a shiny object that somebody is shaking in front of you. And, you know, there's going to be the quick, I, I don't know. I just, for me, it never really felt like something um, I wanted to do. So I didn't do it. Yeah. You mentioned vendors, you know, well, during COVID and really now, uh, I, I see a lot of multifamily operators on some of our Facebook forums saying, hey, anybody have a plumber? Anyone have a roofer? And these are people that have been in business forever, but historically they treated their vendors as commodities. If you weren't the low price bid, I'm going to find the next person. They do that with lenders as well. What's your advice to people when it comes to working with vendors, whether you are a smaller newer operator or somebody that's more established? I mean, I think uh, communication, uh, trust, and competency are, are sort of the, the things that we look for at the company when we're evaluating new vendors. We're constantly looking um, just because the nature of our business, whether it's my property or, or a property we're managing from someone else, uh, we're obligated to get the best possible price and the best service we can. And so that means we, oftentimes we have to get multiple bids, um, even, you know, water heater replacement today, earlier before the call, uh, HVAC system. Um, these are big ticket items that owners and owners who don't necessarily like live here or are intimately familiar with what's going on, they need to, they, they always like want to gain a better understanding of what's happening. So when we are, are talking to vendors, um, we're looking for responsiveness. Um, we're looking for uh, somebody who knows what they're talking about. That's that competency piece. And then we're looking for, we're not always necessarily looking for like the cheapest price. Cause like you, you do get what you pay for. Um, but we certainly don't pay top dollar. So yeah, go ahead. Do you not want to continue to use your preferred vendor? Somebody that did a great job for you last time, someone, you know, that they're not going to cause headaches. Uh, they might be more expensive. Uh, it depends on what it's for. Um, it's just, you know, like there's so many, just like property management, there are like all the trades, whether it's roofing, plumbing, electrical, um, you name it. There's a lot of different companies and there's a lot of different people to choose from. And when you're networked in Chicago with other managers and other owners and other business owners, people like that, you kind of share um, vendors and you get to kind of know like who's good um, and reliable and gets you a good price. And like, I'm sure you've been doing this show for a long time, like good news travels fast. So if somebody's really good and they're, they're reasonably priced and they are competent and they communicate well, that word gets around. 
And then the key to keeping those vendors is making sure that you're not chewing them down on price on every single uh, repair or replacement. And that when it comes time for them to get paid, you pay them like as quickly as you can. We're, we're net 15, net 30. Um, and a lot of people really, really like that. And you need that, like they're not commodities. They're, they're, they're a part of your team. Um, I can't tell you my HVAC um, person is one of my most valuable vendors. And he, uh, when it gets super hot and stuff breaks because we have a longstanding relationship and we trust each other, when my stuff breaks and I call him, he picks up the phone, he gets over there, he fixes it and I, I bill the owner and I don't really get a lot of blowback there. So I know that we're doing a good job. And that's kind of, we, we were trying to cultivate that type of dynamic with our vendors, like pretty much every day. And you syndicate your own deals as well, right? That's correct. Yeah. Talk more about that. What kind of deals are you doing? Oh, six flats, you know, so gut rehab, a lot of value add. Um, we've done up three units, a uh, lot of six flats. Um, I think our, you know, biggest building is like an eight unit. So not, nothing, nothing too big, um, but a lot of, a lot of littler ones. And um, we look to add value to buildings in neighborhoods that are emerging, or at least that was sort of the modus of operandi before COVID. Um, now we're just kind of looking for um, deals that we're just looking for good deals, or maybe we can push rents. Uh, maybe something's under rented, or um, it has been mismanaged, or there's de deferred maintenance that we can that we can justify uh, a price where we can come in and fix it, and it still works for us. Um, so. Pre-pandemic, we were more like, let's go hard at the gut rehab to the studs, you know, like basement to the roof, get everything brand new, stabilize it, and then um, hold it. Our strategy is always to hold. We don't really flip or, or sell. Um, but since the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, I bought three buildings and um, all of them were in really good areas. I, I actually just, it just seemed to, to be a good time to buy buildings in good areas. Um, but, but mostly, most of the stuff we're doing are in, in emerging neighborhoods in Chicago. And we're looking for stuff that we can kind of just buy and manage. And then in five to seven years from now, um, if we wanted to renovate, then we could. So that's, that's what we've been chasing these days. What are the emerging neighborhoods in Chicago? Uh, personally, I really like Pilsen and Little Village. I like, uh, um, Avondale, Logan Square. I like um, Uptown and Edgewater. Uh, those are kind of almost there. I mean, a lot of these neighborhoods I'm mentioning, I got into in like 2015. So they've, they've kind of come a long way since then. Um, but those are, those are my favorite neighborhoods right now. And I'm always kind of looking for, for new, for like the next, the next hot neighborhood. Out of my own curiosity, how's that Wrigleyville, uh, Lincoln Park area doing right now? Well, I, I, that's where we're, uh, I'm talking to you from. I, my office is in Lincoln Park. Um, Still hot? Oh, hot as, yeah. as uh, hot as hell. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're at, we're at, like to put it into perspective, we're at Fullerton, Lincoln, and Halstead, which is right where um, the DePaul University is. And the building that I, ma I'm, I manage and I uh, lease from the owner uh, here in Lincoln Park, during the pandemic with the rents for a three bed, two bath, um, this is a new construction building, 2020, um, three bed, two bath, 1200 square feet, we were getting 4,700 on average. Um, we're re-renting these things now for like 55. Wow, so what a jump, yeah. It's a big jump, yeah. Is that burrito place still there called Allende? Uh, Allende, yes, it's there. It's still there. One of the greatest places ever. Best ever listeners, if you're there, it, it is incredible. Um, back to real estate. So what kind of deals do you put together for syndications? What, what, what does a typical syndication deal look like in terms of returns, hold period, et cetera? Sure. So um, in terms of like, are we talking like, structure like you know a lot of yep. times we're, we're looking i don't really like the whole pref game uh the preferred return thing i try to make things as straightforward um and fair for everybody as possible uh, early in the early in my career somebody i think the saying goes and i hope i don't screw this up uh uh 
hogs get fed, pigs get slaughtered. Um, so like, you never really like, you, you never, you don't want to shoot yourself in the foot um, asking for too much, right? Like, so my, my strategy is to find, identify a building, lock it up under contract, and then go through my Rolodex of investors or partners um, and ask them if they're interested in the deal, kind of tell them broad stroke what I'm thinking. Generally, the way I like to do things is like, I'll sign on the debt, you sign on the debt. Um, I'll put in um, some amount of equity, um, you know, so that it's meaningful for you, normally about 10%, five to 10%. Um, and I'm looking for like a 60, 40 split. And the strategy is usually, you know, like the term loan terms are normally five, seven years. So we're, we're probably looking um, at holding for five to seven years. And then, you know, I haven't sold anything yet. Like we, we just refinanced everything um, during the pandemic. Um, so that's sort of like, and then as far as like, that, that's like terms and how we try to set up the, the splits uh, with the, the partners. Um, and then what was your other, what was the other thing you were asking about? How many partners do you typically take on, on a deal? Like one, two max. Okay. So this is more of a joint venture than it is a syndication. I guess you could say that. And what is the typical return that these investors would see? Let's say an annualized cash on cash return or IRR. Like eight to 12%. Is, is pretty typical for the deals I do. The small, you know, the smaller ones, it's harder to, you know, the, the bigger deals, you get a, a larger economy to scale, um, but they, they require more capital and maybe they're a little more risky. Um, so we like, I like the smaller deals and spreading out the risk throughout multiple neighborhoods or blocks or buildings. Um, and then there are some investors who are with me on four or five buildings. There are others that we've just started. We've done one, maybe two. Um, that's, that's, uh, have you thought about starting a fund? I've thought about it. Um, I'm not interested in starting a fund. <laughs> Why not? I think even if things go right, people, you know, like it can, uh, it, it just like, that's, it's too many cooks in the kitchen for me. Like I, I don't know enough about it to be truthful with you to really, expound on it too much. I've, I've explored it, poked around with friends of mine. Um, maybe I'm just not there professionally to stomach something like that. Um, but I just don't feel like I need to. Yeah, I get it. And the reason you don't like prefs, why is it specifically that you don't want to pref? You don't want to be obligated if the deal is not making money yet. Is that part of the reason? Yeah, I think it kind of, I think it throws a, um, I think it's very traditional and, you know, it's kind of like one of those things that everybody does. So if you're a seasoned real estate investor, you're going to expect that. Um, but I would rather give up more of the deal than, than look at like a, like a preferred return for somebody. Um, just because like, I don't want to chase like that. Like I want to, I want to chase the deal. And I want everybody to succeed. And it just feels sometimes like I'm, it almost makes me feel subservient or more subservient um, when you have a six to 8% preferred return that, you know, and then, you know, you, you can end up cutting corners or, or making um, bad decisions when you're motivated by um, making sure that you're getting somebody your preferred return back is sort of my philosophy on it. And I love that because everybody is seven, eight percent pref, you know, whatever IRR, it's all the same out there. So I like that you're going against the grain. Do the investors typically have an issue signing on debt? Not mine. Okay. No, because I'm signing with them. Okay. And then the tax benefits to them, is that part of the explanation to them? Most of the people that I'm dealing with are in real estate already and they okay. understand that. Um, but yeah. John, what is your best real estate investing advice ever? <laughs> uh, you know, like uh, I think, I think uh, acquisition cost covers a multitude of sins. So if you can get uh, property at the right price, um, you can kind of, for lack of a better term, screw up construction or, you know, um, you, you know, there's overages, time, time and, uh, and, and construction can kind of crush your, your, your returns. 
Um, so I would just say like when you're buying, if you're just starting out, like buy something that's a home run. Don't buy anything unless you are absolutely sure it's a home run. And my other advice would be um, find the property and the money will follow. That's something I learned really early on is that don't concern yourself with, you know, oh, I need millions of dollars to start in real estate. It's not like that. You can, you can really do it with no money if you, if you were wanted to. Um, but um, I lost my train of thought there. I was, no, I, I love that because uh, I, I was on a real estate forum and I, I read a post where somebody said, Hey, does anyone else think it's BS that people always say, if you have the deal, the money will come. And literally 99% of the responses were, yeah, only people with money say that. Uh, yeah, that's not true. I've tried it. It's not true. And really, if you don't have the network, it's not going to be true. But if you have a great deal and you have even the, the smallest high net worth networker, you know, the really just the right network, the money will come. And it's so important for people to understand that. Can I tell a quick story? Yeah, please do. Uh, my very first deal that I that I um, raised money for and I invested in and partnered up was in Logan Square, um, like west side of Logan Square towards like Pulaski and Armitage for you people familiar with Chicago. Um, a, a broker friend of mine had an off market four unit that had tons of space in the basement. The, the seller was like living in the basement. Um, wanted to get out of this deal, had owned it for a long time, tried to rehab it himself, could not succeed if he tried. And uh, they brought me the deal at, um, they, they said, it's a four unit. Uh, the guy wants, I think, I forget what they said he wanted for it. I ended up paying 365,000 for it. And we put about um, initially 400 grand of, uh, of, of construction dollars into the deal. Um, and so my plan though was like these huge basement spaces. I'm like, well, we can maybe we can add a unit. We're not going to know that until much later, till after we'll, we'll never find that out during due diligence. So does the deal work as a four unit? Well, I brought my architect through and he's like, you know, the space in here, there's a lot of dead space. You can add an extra bathroom. These these two bedroom one baths could become three bed, two baths. And, you know, I got really excited. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the deal I've been waiting for. This is the one, you know, like, and I knew the, the value, you know, in Logan Square at that time, um, rehab, you know, gut rehab stuff's like 100, 125 a door. I'm getting it for, you know, much less than that. And uh, I picked up the phone and the first guy I called uh, was is my first investor and I've invested with five deals with them. I called them up, I said, hey, um, I had prepped him, telling him what my plan was and that I was looking for stuff. And if I found something that I thought was awesome, I'd call him. And I found this deal and I put it under contract. And right as soon as I put it under contract, I made one call and uh, he was in. And we, we set the deal up um, in like two seconds with, our, with the attorney. And we ended up closing it. We rehabbed it. And I was able to get the fifth unit added which increased the value of the building, you know, significantly, probably, probably by at this point, 200,000. So um, it just goes to show you, you know, like uh, if, if you have the deal, the money will follow. I mean, most of the stuff I do, it's one phone call. Like I am not, I'm not going through calling six to eight people. I'm making like one or two phone calls, you know, well, let me think about it. And, you know, like I'm saying, all right, hurry up though. Cause I gotta, I gotta do this, you know? And then, you know, you're either in or you're out. I don't really care. It's no harm, no foul. Like I, you know, if you're out, I don't care. I'll still bring you stuff if you want me to. Um, so people know like one way or another, I'm on my path and I'm going to buy real estate and I'm going to partner with people. If it looks good to them, they should pull the trigger. Yeah. And even people that don't have the network to raise all the money, let's say they're just starting out. If you have the deal, the money will come still holds true because you can always sell the deal to somebody, get a finder's fee. And even if you get nothing in return, you just hook somebody up with a really good deal. They'll remember you and maybe they'll mentor you or, you know, maybe they'll bring you in on a next deal or whatever it is. But yeah, just having a great deal. There's so many ways to get returns on it, even if it's not monetary. So yes, great advice. And thank you for that. John, are you ready for the best ever lightning round? Let's do it. All right, John, what's the best ever book you recently read? Uh, the Obstacle is the Way by Ryan Holiday. 
What was the big takeaway on that? That life is full of challenges and obstacles, and unless you can figure out a way to make them into opportunities, um, it's going to be hard for you. The obstacle is the way. Was that the obstacle is the way, and it's basically uh, Marcus. It's like uh, Stoicism. I don't know okay. if you've heard it. It's founded in Stoicism. It's like a lot of it's uh, based in in uh, the philosophy of like uh, Marcus Aurelius, and um, there's just it's just like it's like the business is 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 uh like a thousand pound weight sometimes and every day like i said there are challenges and if you don't know how to take these challenges kind of with a grain of salt and make them into opportunities for for you or your company or your partners um it makes things tough and and you, you lose that way and we want to win you know yeah that's a great outlook john what's the best ever way you like to give back best ever way so like i'm a military vet um, I'm, I'm involved. I'm a member of like uh, disabled American veterans. I'm a, a member of the uh, uh, veterans of foreign wars. Um, we, we like to donate and give time to some of the local um, homeless veteran housing organizations in the Chicago area. Um, I wrote it down. I've got uh, a safe haven is one and uh, inner voice is another one. And then my wife, uh, she spends time with uh, off the street club, which is another another organization that we're involved with. And John, how can the best ever listeners reach out to you? Uh, well, I'm on Facebook. I'm on t- Twitter. We're on, uh, uh, you, you know, the web. You can find us at www.hifipm.com. Um, That's H-I-F-I-P-M.com. Um, but really the best ever way to get in touch with me is to email me directly at John, J-O-H-N, at hifipm.com. John, I got to ask one more question that I wanted to ask earlier. When someone's doing a pro forma, what should their property management fee be typically? Five uh, percent. Okay. You know, I mean, uh, that's where I'm at. Um, you know, I think it depends on the neighborhood and it depends on the scale. Sometimes bigger buildings, it's going to be a lower management fee. Um, cause again, there's that economy to scale there. Uh, but most of the deals that we do are in the, uh, six to 50 unit range and we're, we're charging between four and 6%, which is why of, of gross rents. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Got it. John, I got to thank you for being on the show today. Uh, thank you again for your service in the Navy at 24. Somehow you knew you wanted to go into real estate and you took on what many consider the worst part of multifamily, which is property management. Uh, So thank you for all the tips and tricks that you've given us. And we wish you the best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. Um, I love being on the show and uh, I had a good time. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Best ever listeners. Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. Share the podcast with someone you think can benefit from it. Also follow, subscribe, and have a best ever day. (laughs) 